High Adventure. Terrorism, the scourge of our time and against which civilization seems powerless, takes a sinister turn in tonight's story by Roger Service entitled Panic Station. Look, Mr. Pringle, I know only too well that this is a small paper. But without reporters, it won't exist at all, and reporters must eat. Only if they produce the goods, Bob. News, that's the name of the game. Without it, the Daily Review's done for, and us along with it. Yes, but you Yes, must... but nothing. When last did you turn in a story worth printing? What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Hard headlines, the stuff that makes people buy papers. The rubbish you pull in might work in the women's weeklies, but it's not newspaper material. And you've got the gall to come in here asking for a raise. Mr. Pringle, it's not my fault if I'm not given the lead. I'm giving you one now, Bob, to the door. There. You see that operation? Ninety-three men fully employed, all with wives, kids and mortgages. And every one of them entirely dependent on you and the rest of the reporting staff to bring home the bacon. I've been doing my best, Mr. Pringle. Well, then this might come as something of a blow. It isn't good enough. Now hit the pavement, Winters, and if you don't find a story out there, just keep walking the other way. Hi, the name's Bob Winters, newspaperman extraordinaire. <laughs> Extraordinaire, because no other news hound I've ever heard of has lived for so long so close to the bread line. But, uh, like most hard luck stories, there are compensations. In my case, just one, and all gift-wrapped in the sensational form of Samantha Booth, 110 pounds of gorgeous English womanhood, all five foot two of her. And she's all mine, or will be if I ever find anything my friendly pawnbroker's prepared to swap for a ring. Sounds like Pringle means it this time, Bob. Yes, I'm afraid so, Sam. If I don't come out with a story with a page one or two rating, like soon, then I can kiss journalism goodbye for good. I just don't understand it. Your writing's brilliant. What I've seen you do with Dollar's Ditchwater assignments is nothing short of incredible. <sighs> That's the blast of trouble, Sam. The only nods I ever get are in the direction of Lady Somebody or Other's Garden Party the officers of the Assistant Secretary to the Bournemouth Street Sweepers Association. Well, how on earth can Mr. Pringle expect you to come up with blockbuster headlines? Yeah, well, that's the $64,000 question, my sweet. Come on, I'll explain it over a cup of tea, while I can still afford it. So, that's about the size of it, Sam. It's a combination of office politics and the new boys in Rome. So you're new at the Daily Review, but I don't understand the other bits. Look, Sam... The review is the smallest circulation paper on the streets. But they offered you a job when no one else would. That still doesn't answer my question. Well, I'm coming to that. It's a small setup, and like all small offices, the new guy has to, well, somehow survive long enough to maybe get himself approved by the clique. And that includes the people in the research department. So when I call in for a lead, I get the nothing jobs, while the established blue-eyed boys pick up the plums. It's really that simple. But surely Pringle understands that. No, it's not that simple. Pringle belongs to the old school of paper running. Somehow the age of wire services and news agencies has passed him by. To him, a reporter is some harassed guy with a press ticket stuck in the band of his trilby with an upturned brim and pounding the street with a notepad and pen, waiting for a safe to fall out of the window. <laughs> well, so long as your sense of humor remains intact, Bob, we'll get by. Yeah, yeah I'd like to think so. Bob, I, I love you very much. I just want you to know that. I love you too, Sam. But... But what? Well, I, um, I don't quite know how to say it, Sam. Well, try but... simple, unambiguous words. Works every time. Well, just this. I'm 34, about to be unemployed, and with pretty gloomy prospects. Are you really sure you want to be stuck with me? I'd understand... Bob if... Winters, we've been engaged for almost three years, and in that time I've got to know you pretty well, faults and all. <laughs> and what's happening here now doesn't come under the heading of endearing quality... It's a guilt complex and gets added to the faults, okay? I see. Now, whether you like it or not, you're eventually going to break down and buy that ring, and the sooner the better. Ah, Sam, you're terrific. Give us a kiss. Yeah? It's an order. <laughs> hey, that's enough. Come on, let's get out of here. People are staring. Ah, they're jealous. But you're right. Let's go. 
I'll call the review, see if there's anything on a go. I'm running a little late, Bob. I'll have to head back to the office. It wouldn't do for both of us to be out of work. Well, just let me make that call and I'll walk with you. You never know. <laughs> Might see that falling safe yet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a call box. Try it. Maybe it's the one in London that actually works. As it happened, it was. I called the research department, the review, and was given the earth-shattering news that a bit of unrest, <laughs> that descriptive Orwellian term, was developing outside the labour exchange in Ladbroke Grove, Notting Hill. And would I cover the story? Riots in Notting Hill? Oh, well, it beats garden parties. Things are looking up. Yeah, the public rates riots along with shuttle launches now in a dead boring. But anyway, it's an improvement. I'll buy that, huh? Well, don't waste time, Bob. This could turn out to be the story to make your name. We were maybe half a mile from the review's offices in Fleet Street near St. Paul's Cathedral. I was a fair distance from my destination. Well, the quickest way will be by Tube. Blackfriars Station's just around the next corner. Yeah, you're right. The district line. If I'm not mistaken... That'll take me all the way to Notting Hill, huh? Mm, it does. And I'll get off at Sloane Square. You see? You're getting lucky. Yeah, I'll get real lucky the day. Certain Miss Booth become Mrs. Winters. Come on. We have a train to catch. Here she comes, right on time. You know, I've lived in London for six years now, and I've never ceased to be amazed at the fact that at any one time, thousands of people are whizzing about on trains in every direction, <laughs> hundreds of feet below ground. Yeah, it'd be harder to imagine getting along without him. In you go now, and mind the doors, please. <laughs> <laughs> It's just the teeniest bit scary, don't you think? Hmm? What was that? Hurtling along like this underground. Supposing a train was coming the other way on the wrong track. <laughs> Sam, you're impossible. <laughs> no, I take that back. You're female and you're quite wonderful. You really do love me, Bob. Now, that's a silly question. Huh? Well, then, cloaked in the anonymity of London and deep underground, who'd mind if you gave me a little cuddle? Absolutely no one, can you? <laughs> Absolutely no one, that is, except two turban-clad gentlemen who were eyeing us intently from across the companionway. Who cares? They should be more concerned with Enoch Powell than with us. Where are we, do you know? Fancy asking a Londoner that. I know my district line, no? Next stop, uh, Westminster, then St. James Park, Victoria, then Stone Square. Where we part and so tonight. Good luck with the story, Bob. Well, I didn't need luck, just a story. Nothing more, nothing less. The train pulled into Westminster... And a dozen or so people got off and were replaced by members of the Pinstripe Brigade. Probably a bunch of minions from the corridors of power in Whitehall, somewhere above us. The train pulled out, heading for St. James's Park. But it hadn't gone more than a few hundred yards into the Black Tunnel, when suddenly... Just going on. Bob! Bob, what's happening? I haven't a clue. The train's jammed on brakes. That much I do know. Besides, silence, all of you. Sharif, guard the connecting door. One of the two turbaned men pushed his way unceremoniously towards the end of the carriage, while the other redressed the tense and frightened passengers. Now listen to me. This train has been commandeered by the Cyrenaican Liberation Army. What? what? Be silent! If you do exactly as you are told, you will come to no harm. But what are you trying to do? Your government has refused to cooperate in a matter of extreme concern to us. They will think differently now. We have not merely hijacked an airliner. We have hijacked more than 400 people who are at this moment sitting beneath your beloved houses of parliament. <laughs> and at this very moment, we are connecting the explosives in each carriage, which will, unless we receive your government's cooperation, blow all of us and your houses of parliament up the face of this planet. This can't be happening. I'm afraid it is, Sam. And I'll tell you something else. I don't like the looks of it. And I wasn't kidding. 
door connecting the carriage with the next had opened to admit another beturbaned type unwinding cable from a reel. Incredibly, not one passenger moved. Such is the orderliness of British society. They'd been given an order, they obey it regardless of who gave it. And then, as if to prove me wrong, one passenger leapt from his seat and lunged at the newcomer. Oh, you filthy scum! In a flash, the man called Sharif whipped out his gun and felled our would-be rescuer, who now lay crumpled and dying on the companionway floor. Well done, Sharif. You will be rewarded. Now, the rest of you, listen to me. That man's death was unnecessary. But it will be the fate of any one of you who attempt to interfere with our mission. And just who the hell do you think you are? I'm for crying out loud. Are you just going to sit by while he... Listen, I'm a reporter, not a hero. There's a difference, huh? You ask me who I am, young woman. My name is Yassan, and I mean you no harm. But I do mean to succeed. This, I take it, is your husband. We're uh, engaged. Uh -huh. And very much in love, as anyone can see. That is good. You mind your own damn thing. A woman of spirit, brother. <laughs> a rare breed in my country. <laughs> but perhaps a plague in yours, eh? Thankfully, Sam didn't respond. Your son, whoever he might be, was eyeing the two of us thoughtfully while his two confederates were connecting a cable to the contents of a now open suitcase packed with what looked like cellophane-wrapped rolls of putty. My interest didn't go unnoticed. You are looking at 70 pounds of plastic explosive. Each of the train's carriages is similarly charged, and all are now connected. Should we be obliged to do so, all will be detonated simultaneously. Death will be instantaneous. You're insane. You've got to be. Are the Irish insane for wanting autonomy? The people of Afghanistan? Poland? No, I think not. And we Cyrenaicans are no different. Cyrenaicans? F forgive me, There but... is no time for discussion. What I believed might be the hardest part of this mission is going to be the easiest. We require an emissary to carry our demands to the British government. I believe I have found that man in you. Me? But why me? Because, oh foolish brother, you suffer an all-consuming passion for this woman. You will not wish her to come to any harm. Eh? Well, what do you want me to do? Your task is a simple one. You are to merely deliver this envelope to the members of the British police force, who, at this very moment, will be converging at the station we so recently left. Now come with me. Your son led the way towards the rear of the train. I took a last look at Sam. She was crying softly, and there was nothing I could do to comfort her. I tried to ignore the dead body I was obliged to pass, but I couldn't. The train's passengers were mute with fright and horror, but their eyes spoke volumes as we passed silently by. In each of the nine carriages, the scene was the same. Each had two Serenaicans, I took them to be, who were brandishing deadly-looking pistols. Each had an open suitcase loaded with plastic explosive and cables running from one to the other. Eventually, we reached the end of the train. Now here, take this envelope and see that it is opened first by the Libyan ambassador. After that, all will become clear regarding our demands. Look, the girl. What will you... <laughs> you are a fool, my friend, but I will make you a promise. If you do what is required of you, then you have my word that the woman will be released one hour before the deadline set in those documents. Fail us. And you have my word, just as solemnly, that the woman will die, whether or not the British government meets our demands. My name's North. His is Alloway, British Intelligence. What's going on down there? I really don't know. I mean, some crazy bunch of... Look... I don't know who they are, but they, they've got my girl. They said they... Look, you've got to help me. There are hundreds down there. Now, let's get to the facts without wasting time. How come they released you? The question was reasonable enough, but reaction was beginning to set in. I couldn't articulate the thoughts racing through my mind. I blindly handed him the envelope. Hmm. It's in Arabic or some such. Get us to Operations HQ fast, Stacy. The car roared at speed in what I took to be the direction of Belgravia but I couldn't be sure. My mind was fast becoming a blank. I was hustled into a high-rise building at a vast office somewhere near the top. The walls were ablaze with gigantic maps of London. A group of people were gathered around a large blow-up map of the Westminster area. The bit about the Libyan ambassador came back to me. I burbled it out as best I could. North snatched the phone from a wide choice and barked an order. It's an emergency. You find him, I don't care where. Get him here in ten minutes. 
North obviously carried a lot of weight, because that's exactly what they did. It took me those ten minutes to tell them everything I knew. At the end of it, I felt drained. Then a short, swarthy man in natty western clothes was ushered in by a uniformed policeman. My apologies, Ambassador. No time for introductions. We appear to have a serious problem on our hands. We need your help. What is it you wish? We believe this letter is addressed to you. Please read it, and then we'll explain what we're up against. The Ambassador ripped open the envelope and read its contents with obvious mounting concern. You have no need to explain. Now I understand. Where are the hostages? Well, look at this map. One of our underground tube trains has been hijacked and is presently positioned about here. As near as makes no difference, that's about 300 yards from the northwest corner of the Houses of Parliament. Now, that point some 70 feet underground. They're explosives. Nine carriages, each with 70 pounds of plastic. More than enough to blow a crater in London with a radius of maybe a quarter mile. And Westminster smack in the middle. Thousands might die. Now, well, that's the threat. Now, what can we do to defuse it? What's the demand? Impossible. The letter is signed by Sinusu Yassan, the leader of a murderous fanatical group calling itself the Cyrenaican Liberation Army. They have been causing havoc in Libya for some years. Well, Libya doesn't do too badly itself. I beg your pardon. Uh, nothing, Ambassador. Go on. Cyrenaica is one of the provinces making up the state of Libya. And this savage organization has been agitating for self-rule. Under Yassan, they have become increasingly militant. Yes, you're telling me there's 400 plus below ground and countless thousands above ground with the necks on the block to prove it. Now, what's the demand? Impossible. They demand that before midnight tonight, the British government formally requests the Libyan authorities to grant sovereign status to the ancient province of Cyrenaica. I see. Well, it's like you said, Ambassador. Impossible. <laughs> Yes, you heard me. I don't care how many departments you have to call out to do it. I want the entire area within those boundaries I've mentioned evacuated and wake the back benches up. They won't have had this much excitement since Churchill's day. But what about my fiancé? I'm the passengers. Aren't you going to do anything? You got any suggestions? Well, for heaven's sake... Yeah, well, that's what I thought. For Pete's sake, don't tell me that you're going to calmly let this happen. Aren't you even going to notify the government? Oh, yes. Not that it'll do any good. Britain wouldn't dream of becoming involved. They'd even take three days wording the reply to that effect. And the midnight deadline's now just five hours away. So, like I said, any suggestions? What about you, Ambassador? Such matters are not my province. Have you no forces you could attack with? You have them blown up as well. Monty! Sir? You got a phone link with the train yet? Yes, direct line, sir, on number five. All right, switch on the amp. Let's all hear what's going on down there. Amp bomb, sir. Oh, uh, Effendi, we have Effendi you... Effendi is a Turkish term of respect, wholly inappropriate to the military chief of the Cyrenaican Republic. To whom am I speaking? Uh, no disrespect intended. This is North British intelligence. Has the matter been placed before the proper authorities? Uh, well, yes, but we need more time. You have time between now and midnight, and not the moment more. <sighs> well, gentlemen, there you have it. If there was any doubt about the negotiability of the terms, I don't think there can be any left now. So what are you going to do now? Do? Well, what can we do? We wait. Maybe it's a bluff. Are you crazy? Supposing it isn't. Then one hell of a lot of people get killed and a lot of London will have to be rebuilt. Next question. But I don't believe what I'm hearing. You Williams, can't... make sure the news clamp stays watertight, William. Anybody responsible for a leak to the media will be hung, drawn, quartered, and then garroted. You mean the word isn't out already? Not one. That's the way it stays. At least until we know the worst. Oh, forgive me for mentioning it. It yes, might be nothing at all. Just the piece of information I have which you might evaluate and find to our mutual advantage. Try me, Ambassador. We're on a losing streak up to now. Senusi Yassan, in addition to being the leader of the CLA, is also the religious head of the sect. A yeah, nice peaceful doctrine they must have out there. Their religion is primitive. And like all early religion, it is brutal, almost bloodthirsty. Hmm. What do we have here? Another Ayatollah? Much more dangerous. But there is one thing. All right, what is it? Senusi Yassan may never carry a weapon of war. It is a strict code which we know he adheres to. So? So, if it were possible to physically overpower Yassan, the tables would be, how do you say, completely turned. Yeah, have you forgotten he's got two men in each carriage down there? His strength may also be his weakness. None would dare endanger the life of their spiritual leader. Under such circumstances, I am certain his military role would be subjugated. <sighs> That's one hell of a long shot. How do we get a man aboard? We've established that he's got lookouts posted at either end of the train while he's holding court in the center carriage with one hand on the detonator. Well, it uh, 
just occurred to me. Hey, uh, why are you all looking at me like that? Interesting thought, isn't it? You're the only one likely to be allowed back on board. Yes. How would you like to have a bash at saving more than 400 lives, your fiancés included, not to mention a large chunk of old London town? Hmm? That's right, your son. We're sending the same man back with a written government response. Yes, right away. I sincerely hope so. Maybe we'll drink to it yet. Goodbye. Right, you're on your own, Winters, but only physically. In every other way, the rest of us are right behind you. Well, thanks a lot. All right, you know what to do. He'll be more than a little anxious to get his hands on this OHMS envelope. The big risk is that he might frisk you on the way in. Somehow I don't think so. And when he's ripping over the envelope, whip out that gun from the ankle holster and get a drop on him. Do you think you can do it? Well, if I don't, I won't get a second chance. Well, you said it. All right, let's see the action again. Go with the gun. Now! How's that? Uh, you wouldn't exactly have sent tingles down John Wayne's spine. But it'll have to do. Now, remember, have you got the drop on him, all you'll have to do is kick the phone off the cradle and yell like blazes. We'll come running from 300 yards away. It'll all be over in no time at all. <sighs> you make it sound so easy. You'll make it. You just have to. The journey back to the stalled train 70 feet below London was every bit as daunting as from it. But it wasn't long before I was being hauled aboard by one of the politico-religious maniacs. For one horrible moment, I felt the heavy gun wobble in my unaccustomed ankle holster, but it held. I approached your son with a large but bogus OHMS envelope, arm outstretched. Ah, you see? Your government appreciates the sincerity of my words. My heart was in my mouth. I didn't wait for him to open the envelope. My life was now hanging on the Libyan ambassador's hunch. As he took the envelope, I went for the gun. What? Hold it right there. And don't move, whatever you do. As I'm here to tell the tale, you'll appreciate that it worked. And like a charm. As North had promised, on the signal, they were there within seconds. In the confusion and indecision, Yassan's murderous army lost the initiative and their private war. Back on the street, Sam and I headed for the nearest phone, followed by swarms of newsmen. The embargo was, of course, now over. I had to contact Pringle with the scoop of the decade. And just where the hell have you been all day? Uh, Mr. Pringle, you I... realize there's been some sort of terrorist attack somewhere? Yes, under Westminster. So and... why is it you can be relied on never to be near the action? Tell me uh, that. Look, will you let me explain, I please? I don't need you to explain. Let me tell you that every reporter in the city is trying to get the details of the attack, and you... Now, for crying in a bucket, Pringle, I'm trying to tell you. You can't tell me anything, you young layabout. When I was your age... Now, listen, you wrinkled fink. What? What you know about oh, this attack you. is absolutely... High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.